Hello, welcome to our weekly review. Um, we're, you're always told that the best thing to do is document, not create. So we're both busy doing different bits inside the business. We're actually in different businesses at the minute. Um, so Blake's working full time on getting one of our new letting agencies up and running and growing that. And I'm busy working with development discovery on some of our development projects that we're involved in. Um, so different ends of the spectrum, different business activities means we don't see each other pretty much all week. Hey, bro. Hey. <laughs> uh, literally the first time we've seen each other this week, I think. Yeah, since last Friday, Saturday yeah. or something, yeah. Saturday, yeah. So um, what we want to do is we've been quite keen to start a podcast. Mm -hmm. So um, we had a good chat last week, and I think the week before, and the week before that, and the week before that, last year. about starting a podcast, <laughs> starting some content. Um, and so this actually is just going to be more a chat, I think, to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Um, and hopefully share some useful tips of people watching or listening. Um, and we've got some people that would like to try and interview um, and do some interview podcasts. Essentially, this is an ongoing experiment. Uh, we took the view that we should just... Um, just bloody start and get better later. Yeah. <laughs> Plus in five years when we look back, um, we'll go, ha, what idiots. <laughs> so no, I like it. I think we'll be doing all right. I don't know about useful tips though. No. <laughs> Maybe the only useful tip will be to let people know that we ain't got it figured out. <laughs> um, <sighs> I think that though is a good point. Right, like, um, so you, we definitely don't have it figured out. No. I think too, too many people think you need to, and I'm definitely guilty of it, think that you need to know what is meant to be done at each exact step, in each exact order, yeah. before they start it. Mm -hmm. But um, the last 18 months, especially in the development business, um, <clears throat> just getting punched in the face every week mm -hmm. has been far more experience and learning than mm -hmm. doing what I would normally do, which is reading watching videos, doing lectures, like trying to amass all the information first before doing it. So yeah. I think that's a key point. Well, it's, the more you learn, the less you know, isn't it? Yeah, which is actually really stressful. <laughs> yeah, it's stressful. But as soon as you are able to get yourself to a point where you realize that's a benefit, once you learn that knowing, or at least understanding and accepting that you know less is, uh, puts you in a better position to move forwards because you move forwards without judging the potential outcome of what you're doing. Mm. You know, you, when we started, we'd think about everything way too much because we'd be worried about wanting a specific outcome. Whereas now we have a direction and the outcomes of each decision are a little bit more irrelevant because we know that we have to make a decision and then deal with whatever comes from it. What, what do you mean by that? Well, when you're crippled by trying to figure out what the right decision is, well, it's, it's that old thing, isn't it? The only wrong decision is not making one. You know, and when you're always worried about figure, it, when you're worried about looking like you know what you're doing and looking like you know where you're going, you end up getting crippled by trying to figure out which of two choices is the right choice to make. Yeah. When actually, the right choice to make is either of them. And then once you get past whatever the consequence of that choice is, you then make another one, then another one, then another one. That's how you learn, rather than reading loads of books. I mean, reading loads of books helps. <laughs> it does um, help. But I, it I, does I, help, but neither you or I went to university for business, for example. Yeah. Neither of us did. I didn't even go to university. <laughs> but I would put us against someone that's just finished a business degree yeah. and say, we'd make, if, if you gave us both a million quid, we'd make a shit ton more than they would. So reading loads of books and listening to lectures and stuff like that is great, but it doesn't always translate into... Yeah, I think as well though, it's like um, the other thing, at least I've been learning, or I've always, I've always thought this, right, is that some people, once they make a decision, they stick, to, they stick steadfast to that decision. Yeah. But especially in business, but in life in general, yeah. you're constantly making decisions with in inadequate information. Yeah. So you don't have all the information to hand, mm. and you also don't know all the outcomes. Because mm. I think I definitely spend a lot of time trying to trace what will happen from this. Like, if you've got two choices like you spoke about, mm. I spend a lot of time which I know you don't do this, right? So, 
<laughs> so like you're like completely re like you just get a buzz off reacting to stuff like inbound stuff and you're mm. epic at it if I have to do inbound stuff and react I get crippled because I spend <laughs> too long trying to think about stuff which is why I think about the I try and plan um, but you never have all the information to hand so you don't know what this decision will do but you have to make a decision based on the information you have and if you make that decision and more information comes to light in six weeks time, six months time, a year's time, that it was probably the wrong one, mm. you can change. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can change the decision. Well, we've, we've re, re pathed ourselves a few times, yeah. really. But it's all sort of we've adjusted, steadily gone we've along adjusted the same the path, route. But you could go into the same destination in reality. Mm. But I suppose you're right, though. You know, you'll, you'll stand at the edge of a cliff and figure out the best route down, build a ladder, all that kind of stuff, and I'll come <laughs> sprinting like, we'll past you. <laughs> There's actually this story, and it, it was um, probably not directly relatable, but um, we, we went skiing one year with my, with, uh, with my parents, with our parents. Um, what are you trying to tell me? Uh, you don't want to know yet. <laughs> <laughs> In episode two, we revealed, <laughs> um, and we, we were going down what's called a, it was a um, downhill section, so it was a section of a downhill race. I can't remember yeah. which race it was. Um, they don't, they don't um, piece this because it's just too steep. They only do it once a year. Well, the thing was the but, actual so piece comes comes we around through the thing, and then it? we're going down, and then there's a little lip, right? And so my dad was ahead of us, and he stopped, and he was peering over the edge, like this, looking down, going, "Ooh." It's a bit steep. It's a bit, ooh, that's steeper than where we just came from. And Blake just went, boom, <laughs> bombed past him and said, come on, Dad. <laughs> Followed quickly by me and the friend that we were with. And so we, all the parents were up there like, oh, shit, we're just going to have to go now. Um, and a lot of that is like, that I think relates back to business and life that sometimes the best thing to do is just go. But also relates back to what you were saying. Because I bombed down it, but then there was a point on that downhill slope where I'd go, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> uh -oh. let, let me adjust what I'm doing right now. And I'll start doing this a bit more sensibly because there, there was a brief moment of death in front of me. <laughs> uh, just for an interesting fact, we got to the bottom of this section. It took us maybe 30 minutes to get down this section, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It right, and we got lethal. to the bottom and the guy that we were with, um, one of our, one of our like, friends' dads, we got to the bottom of this section after that lip. It took us like 30 minutes to ski down it and we were relatively okay skiers. Got to the bottom and said, yeah, they don't even touch that. Because they go so fast yeah, yeah. off that lip, they just clear, they just clear that whole like about section. 100 meters or something ridiculous. They just clear the whole section and they get to the land at the bottom of where we'd got to. Kind of fucked with how good I felt about going down <laughs> there, didn't it? But yeah, it's just make, if you, you have to make decisions, you have to make them with not with inadequate information and you have to be able to change your decision as more information becomes available. Yeah. I see too many people like they either don't make and I'm guilty, don't make a decision until they've got more information, mm. in which case they stagnate and they don't make progress mm. and they miss an opportunity. Or they make the wrong decision and then it clearly is the wrong decision. It's not the wrong decision at the time, but it becomes clear it's the wrong decision. Mm. And they don't change what they were doing, they don't accept it. It's mm. like at that point, pe most people will dig their heels in mm. and say, "No, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right," and then it just like digs just, a deeper, there's, deeper there's, hole. There's two ways to that, though, because if it becomes clear it's a wrong decision, there are a lot of people that will dig their heels in. True, but also a lot of people will make a decision and then listen way too much to external voices or even internal voices that are convincing them it was the wrong decision and then they change what they do rather than sticking to their guns. Yeah. There's a constant balance in that that you've got to try and figure out really, isn't there? Mm. And I think the, there isn't a right way to do it beyond doing it in, in a way that makes you feel okay about it. Mm. You know? Because re realistically, I mean, you've got a goal or you've got a direction, you've got an end point, you've got all of this stuff, but realistically, the only thing that judge it, the only thing that matters to judge whether you are successful is whether you're happy with what you did. Mm. Like yes, there's numerics, money, employee, like whatever numbers you want to put on it. Ultimately, it all means shit all if you're not happy with it. 
But even that's got its own fine line to balance on because I think there's definitely a, a type of person who is, you know, born to do this stuff, who to some degree is never happy with it. You know, if you're a creative type, which actually, although a lot of people seem to think entrepreneurs are not, I think when you do this, you have to be a creative type because you're always trying to figure out solutions, right? And so if you're a creative type, as soon as you've made something, you're kind of unhappy with it because you know, oh, I could have done this better, I could have done that better. Yeah. But if you're not, I think if you're not unhappy with what you did to the point of like, you know, wishing you did it differently, because the good thing about what we do is you set a goal, you get there. If you think, could have done this, this, and this differently, you just adjust that for the next one that you yeah. do. Yeah. Like what we're going to do with the, the new letting agents. Yeah. You know, we've built, this one was built by dad, did it amazingly. We figured out what maybe me and you would want to do differently, bought a new place, done it differently, and there's already stuff now where we're going, yeah, okay, definitely. next time it needs to be different because we can't do this again, you know? Can you feel the pain? <laughs> not do it again. I'm not doing it. What? So, what things would you change next time? I wouldn't have jumped off the cliff so quickly. Let's dig in on that this week. Um, so, just let's uh, let an agency that Dad and Mum both originally set up to manage our own portfolio. Then they. Um, then they grew that and did it for other people. So mm -hmm. they've done that over a period of time, but the focus was always on managing their own stock. Yeah, so they've been <coughs> a, a very similar size for a very long time. Yeah. But that's fine because it's it was more about the underlying property assets. But yeah, I think it was about we, managing our own stock. It was about, in, if we're honest, it was about dad having something to do. Yeah, <laughs> so he didn't get you know, bored. Yeah. So you, when we looked at it though, well, especially when I looked at it, I saw that the return on capital employed in a letting agency, when done correctly, is actually really quite high. I think we ran the calculation, the return on equity was something like 27%. Yeah. And you speak to residential investors and ultimately- and that's, that's net as well. Yeah, we'll get to like commercial and different asset types. So residential investors spend all their time, it seems, in the current like industry environment seeking yield. Mm. So I call like yield seekers because um, most of them are constantly searching for the best strategy to generate the highest yield. Mm. Um, <laughs> but so the yield seeker, and, and that was the biggest thing I had to switch when I started looking at commercial because yeah. the best commercial deals are the lowest yield mm -hmm. ones, not the highest yield. Mm. Because it's a, it's a relative confidence in your investment. Mm. But anyway, so we were like, Wow, so 15% yield on a residential investment is pretty good, 20% is fantastic. And so I was like, oh, I wonder what- To a degree, 20% is almost unheard of. Yeah. In, uh, in, in, in continuous yield, rather than a return if you're selling off, Yeah. 20% on a rental yield is almost unheard of. Yeah, and so you have to be doing something uh, either highly creative or a little bit illegal yeah, or ju just to <laughs> or some be, degree underhanded. Or, or, be, um, or be in one of those areas of the country where it just so happens at this moment in time that works. Yeah, or you got in just before the spike, you, whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, but so it's difficult essentially yeah. to generate that. And we're probably going to get people messages now saying, oh, I get 20% all the time. Um, in which case, I'd happily have a chat about putting some money <laughs> into those deals. Yeah. Um, but, what you, you know, but, I think just. To, to caveat that is what, when we look at stuff, literally every possible number is taken into account yeah. before we look at the net yields. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people will come to us saying their net yields 20% because they pay X amount on their mortgage, then they don't take into account their management, their maintenance, their yeah, yeah. all of that stuff. Yeah. And then with section 24 coming in, they won't take into account that their mortgage isn't a cost. Yeah. We won't go down that. But anyway, back to what we were trying to talk about, or yeah. what I was trying to talk about before I distracted myself. Um, we saw that the return on capital and the return on equity was really quite good. Mm. Um, and also it's become clear anyway that if you look at the marketplace, building an infrastructure first seemed like a really sensible idea. Yeah. So rather than trying to go out and buy property mm. and do deals and leverage infrastructure that was already there, so other agencies mm. and other stuff like that, it seemed like the sensible idea is build an infrastructure first and then grow it by doing transactions. It's funny though, because we, we looked at this exactly, the, like we looked at very similar points, but we saw them in very different ways. You know, because you're talking about the yield on the, the 
the letting agency. Yeah. You're also talking about the infrastructure in the area. I was looking at the cash flow, like forgetting the yield, because I got the deal I got, which I don't think we should discuss really no. at, at this point. Because I got the deal that we got, um, it meant that the cash flow that was going to be coming in was good, which is what we needed at the moment. So the percentage wasn't a thought in my head. The hard cash was a thought in my mm. head. Then <coughs> the using it to get into areas wasn't a thought of infrastructure. It was a thought of relationships, right? And so if I can get into an area and get in amongst the estate agents, which I've realised is a beautiful challenge for me because most estate agents already do lettings. So when I come in and start changing the game in the area, they're not too happy about it. Um, but you're still able to build those relationships, build relationships with contractors because you use contractors yeah. as a letting agent. Yeah, you're giving them work all yeah. the time. So. You know, it's building those relationships and then you get deals coming your way. You start meeting people in the area that have a, a solid understanding of what that area is mm. about, have done a lot there or have lived there all their life. and. You know, for me, it was all about the relationships that that included, whereas mm. you looked at it a very different way. But to me, Which, so this is the part that I'm trying to bring in, is like the relationships, I would say, is also part of that build, infrastructure building. So oh, it's a key absolutely. component of building an infrastructure in an area, especially in property, yeah. but in most business. But those key relationships are a criteria that you need to succeed. Oh, absolutely, yeah. But having something high volume, like a letting agency in an area, means that you're not promising people, like contractors, you're not promising them work when you find a deal and having to overcome that barrier, you're yeah. giving them work regularly. Almost yeah, to the so point where- when you need them. Almost to the point where they're not working for anyone else. Yeah. And then, then you can start having the conversation about, look, we'd like to do some transact, like we're planning now to start doing some transactions, mm. buying some stock and inventory for investors mm. uh, to help them build their portfolios. Mm. Um, and then we get to cherry pick the contractors that work best on those sorts of deals yeah, yeah, yeah. and feed them into that. Mm. And then we can ramp that up, but know that we've still got work for guys mm. and girls um, mm. if we need it. Um, and so. Cool. Hmm? Political. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so what? Didn't say that. What? Um, Let's not go there. We definitely plan on doing this again, again. several times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah sort right, of within yeah. within an hour to two hours of Peterborough, really. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, but essentially, we bought a letting agency that we've spent Blake primarily spent the last three months building. Mm. You've grown it from ninety units to. About 135. 135 units? Yeah, the, the total value of the company's just under doubled in mm. the space of three to four months. There's external, There's other sort of factors to why that was. Um, you know, the types of units we were allowed to do, the knowledge that we had, the, the people I already knew in the area. There's a lot of factors. It was not like we walked blind into an agency and managed to double no, no. the value in less than a year. No, we've been um, doing, we've been involved in this since we were... I was 13 and you were 11 or something yeah, stupid yeah, like yeah. that. It's like we've got background knowledge in it, um, but it was our first transaction we were kind of really... It was the yeah. first thing where there was no hard assets, so it was purely the business transaction. Which is why we had to do the deal so well. Which is why we structured quite, I think, a very good deal for both parties. Oh yeah. And that was the key thing. It, it worked yeah. for us, it worked for... Yeah, you've got to have a win win, win. yeah. Um, but it was the first time we've done something that is not underpinned by a hard asset, yeah, yeah, like yeah. property. Mm. Um, and it's made me want to do it lots more times because mm. it's far more interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it was fun. I think the main thing that I'd change is the preparation prior to taking over. Okay, Which what do you mean? To, to a degree, you know, we were taking on stock or types of stock that we'd never managed before or been involved in managing and dad hasn't managed and yeah. actually we've not really been around anyone that manages that kind of stock. We've invested in some of it. We've invested in but it. But we've, we've then leveraged it. other people yeah, to exactly. manage it. Yeah. Um, so what I mean by the preparation is, you know, a great deal of my time in the last few months has been um, sorting out processes, sorting out paperwork, admin type shit, uh, stuff that I don't really enjoy, but isn't necessary for getting it sorted, right? So I think, I think now that we have a lot of that designed, done, honed down, whittled down, whatever the words are I'm looking for, we've got it in place, basically next time, 
uh, also the systems, right? We've been getting new systems, understanding new systems. Like systems ma- and tools. Yeah, man- yeah, yeah, like all of it, the whole thing, like as in the management, the management yeah. systems, um, having to transfer all the data and having to do that by myself, like all of that stuff, which, you know, it's, it's taken a long time because it's, it's the NOR's jobs, do you know what I mean? It's not really, it's, you know, it, it's frustrating because I'd like to have, have maybe put in the same amount of time on growth when actually I'm putting the same amount of time into foundations. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Both just as important as each other. Well, the, the latter is more important because if you haven't got it at some point, everything's going to come yeah. toppling down. Um, but yeah, so I'd have everything in place, I think, before I moved, well, you know, before on takeover day, I'd almost want to... I'd almost happily shut the place down for two days. Yeah, um, I think we spoke about this the other day, didn't we? Shut the place down for two days, have already booked in, getting new phones in, t- getting a new system, having probably taken all of the information off the old system and got it transferred onto the new system, and then just move that in on the day, spend two days te- like coaching with the people that are in the office, getting to know the people in the office, and then I'd still... I don't think I'd ever want to get to a point where I'm, I'm buying a business that has got employees and I'm buying it, doing two days with them and then leaving them to it. Yeah. You know, I think there's multiple reasons why not to do that, but most of all is to actually try and gain a relationship with the people that I'm working with. You know, I think though it's also about the scale of operation that we have at the minute. Yeah. Right. So you, you want to add value. Uh, yeah. So if you think back to like our foundations as as our exposure into investor in business, right? It was primarily residential and property investing. Yeah. Right. And the the underpinnings of that is you buy something that's undervalued today, for whatever reason, whether it's run down, whether it's oh, we're right. talking about dad. It was always a shit. <laughs> but you buy something that's run There's down. Some stories for another. And day. undervalued, you add value on day one. Yeah. And then you manage effectively to mm-hmm. generate income over the long period of time. So mm-hmm. you create value, like in the immediate aftermath of purchase. Mm. You don't wait a long period of time to create value mm. or hope value comes, you create it, yeah. right? And so the size of businesses that we're looking at at the moment, mm. right, you wanna buy something that's undervalued, typically if it's a business that's undervalued, it means that it's an operational thing or it's a yeah. mar- like it's something in the business that's undervalued and you have to put effort in to create the value. Yeah, but I suppose, I mean, there's, it's more about finding things you can add value to when buying businesses. Yeah. It's finding things you can add value to, but not necessarily things that are undervalued. What we bought, yeah, I guess, was I, I, yeah, was, yeah. Was I get what you're saying. On market yeah. value, we just did it in a way that suited everybody, so that yeah. we weren't yeah, yeah, we weren't forking out all that cash. Um, so it's finding things that you can definitely add value to. You know, there's if we walked into a, a, a successful agency in an area that had little to no competition. Um, and no real clear room for growth, we wouldn't have been able to double it. You just wouldn't be able to, yeah. unless you had con- external contacts with portfolios in the area, which is another way to go, but which is a way we're looking at going with some other areas. But you have to figure out what value you can add and then figure out a way that you can purchase it. At what pot- I mean, it seems undervalued the way we purchased it, but in the end, you know, the full value is being paid. In yeah. fact, even slightly more than the full value is being paid because of the deal that we struck. Yep. You know, but that extra that extra amount that we're paying is m- way more than worth it. Yep. You know, because if we'd have done it a different way, we, ju- we just wouldn't have been able to do it. So I guess it's having that longer, not longer, but more efficient takeover periods. Because that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what that period is, it's a takeover. And I think our takeover, we didn't have a takeover process because I've never done a takeover no, before. We've done, we've done start from scratch and build it before. And mm. we've seen that process, like we've been involved in that process now with this letting agency, with the development company, like with a few different things. Mm. 
but we've not done a takeover before, so that was a first time for us doing that. It was the first time. We were just lucky that it was in a in a business we already had knowledge of. Well, I think we wouldn't have. No, we, we wouldn't. Have. We wouldn't have done it in a business we didn't understand. Because the ultimate goal is to to be doing it in businesses that we potentially don't have this much knowledge of, mm -hmm. but we know how to take over and. and yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we're trying to build efficient at least the business. My perspective is what I'm trying to do, or I think we're trying to do, is build the meta skill yeah. of of that. So you're taking something that's it's same basic principles, take over something that is undervalued mm. for whatever reason. It might be a geographical undervaluation, mm. right? But there's an undervaluation there, um, and there's potential to add value and then add mm. value to it. Mm. it. My perspective is it doesn't really matter what that thing is mm. <laughs> there just has to be upside yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there has to be limit you have to then you have to carefully limit your downside mm. um, I also think a longer not a longer but a more stringent due diligence process would work better y uh, yeah I think well yeah it might have revealed so it would have revealed things that we then could have put in place for the takeover period so it's yeah. just getting that prepped really yeah, I think, but you know, I think there's also, well, it's like we were talking about earlier, we could have gone the other way where we ended up spending way too long worrying about what was yeah, going to happen rather yeah. than just doing it. Yeah. That's 